Um, I'll then introduce in more detail um, our, our uh, speaker tonight, um, and the uh, April, and the uh, Truth About Sharks. So I'll let Arlene take that. Um, and, but I did want to talk about a couple of other things that we have coming up. Um, we have, uh, on Saturday, we have our annual Chowder Fest, 19th Truth to Sex. Lots of really good chowder. It's my first time there, but this I know because I've seen the pictures and I've heard the talk. Uh, that there's a lot of very good uh, chowder, obviously. A lot of other good food, um, a lot of desserts and things like that. Some great wine, I've tried that from the 805 Brewery. Lots of wine, great music, uh, brought to you by Kelly's Lots. So please um, come to that. I think we're selling tickets here. Pat has tickets at the back of the room. And um, in advance, you can get tickets for uh, $25 and it's more expensive at the door. Um, on the 23rd, we have our big fundraiser for the year, Music at the Maritime, um, 23rd of September. Um, and that is a wonderful event. Um, and it's uh, Frank and Dean is the theme. Um, and we will be having a night of uh, Frank and Dean and a sit down and a dinner and lots of music and entertainment, silent auction with really great items. So. Um, also consider us um, sponsoring that event uh, by buying tables, tickets, and, and information. That will be on the website very shortly um, in more detail. Or you can call me at the museum. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And finally, there is um, in our rotating gallery, uh, once the David Anderson show take that in while it's here, uh, when that goes on October the 2nd, um, we have another exhibit called Ocean's Edge, which is a really beautiful uh, photography um, of all up the whole over 1,000 miles of the California coast. And it's a visual artist. Um, it's, a, it's a team of two. Um, and it's visual and there are, there's pros that go with the photographs. So you can look up all the details on, on the website. But they look very, very beautiful, very clean, uh, very modern looking, uh, very elegant. So please um, consider that too. Having said that, I'm going to now turn this over to... Um, oh, I did want to also thank uh, Pablo Ortiz. He's here tonight. He's going to be one of the judges at uh, Chowder Fest. And you all know him from, let's see, Q95.9, right? Live 10.55 and news... 1590 KVTA, I think, is the one that people will know. So, thank you, Pablo, for doing that. Um, Arlene, are you here? Thank you. Welcome, everyone, once again to our speaker series. Uh, before I introduce April, I just kind of want to give you a little bit of a taste of what is the coming attractions in the next three months. Because we have a, uh, we're going to follow our terrific speaker t tonight with some others that I think you're really going to enjoy. Uh, next month, uh, Richard Sennett is going to be here. And he a lot of times talks about ghosts, but I don't know how many people are from this area, but he is going to talk about Hollywood Beach. And uh, it has quite a history, quite an interesting history, including a smoldering Latin lover. <laughs> and uh, then the next one after that should be very interesting to a lot of people. Uh, he's going to talk about hiking and along the Channel Coast, and he is a, um, a historian, avid hiker, and uh, volunteer uh, park ranger. So that also should be particularly interesting. November, I think we're going to have standing room only here. We are having a gentleman. Uh, who is uh, uh, lives in Ventura and retired from the Ventura County Air Quality Control District. And he is going to talk about uh, some of the uh, challenges facing us weather-wise. And uh, I think we're going to hear it from the right person. 
So uh, please, uh, the next three months, you know, plan to come. Now tonight, we're really, really, really happy to have uh, April Delancey. And uh, she has a lot of ties here uh, to our district as well because she spent some of her formative years uh, in Ventura, in Oxnard. She's an avid surfer. And uh, I don't know how she found time, but she also has a bachelor degree in chemistry and marine science, as well as her master's in biomedical science. And she's published in several scientific journals, and she is now uh, working on her own in uh, scientific research and education. So we're ready now for some education. <laughs> and I'm going to give April Williamson. Well, hi, everyone. I want to thank you guys for coming out. I really love to see a packed house. I'm going to talk for a minute and let him adjust the sound. I think everybody can hear me okay? Yeah? yeah? So, since we're talking about the truth about sharks, I have a lot of education for you, including some handouts. I don't know if I brought enough for everybody, but I'm going to hand these out and I ask that if you came with a friend, that you and a friend kind of share them. But I'll put like some in different spots here. And I know the feedback's kind of bad, so I don't have to move around too much. It's really hard for me, um, uh, but um, so we're, while we're getting those out, what I want to talk about. So what you're what you're getting is a little thing from it's uh, from my friends at Pila Bay uh, about all the different sharks in the Santa Monica Bay, which are kind of all the sharks here. Um, most of the sharks you see, like I've been surfing up at Stables, and I see leopards and horns and swell sharks, and you see a lot of those. And what people don't realize, and when you think of sharks, what do you think of? Great white. Of course. It's always the scariest one, right? So there are a lot of other different types of sharks. There are much smaller sharks. Stingrays are in that family. There are stingrays that look like sharks. There are sharks that look like stingrays. They're all the chondrichthyan fish. And um, they're really important in our, not only in our marine ecosystem, but our entire planetary ecosystem and climate. So hopefully when you leave today, you leave with a new sense of appreciation for them. So while that's passing around, I'll give you a little bit about me. Like Arlene said, I'm a Southern California native. There's me in the shark cage in Guadalupe Island. Um, yeah, I'm a surfer, diver, sailor. I'm obsessed with the water. Uh, but And she told you about my credentials. Here's all the people that I've worked with. Right now I am a, I'm Shark Angel's resident shark scientist and I teach uh, everybody from kindergartners to high schoolers at Waterfront Education in uh, Redondo Beach. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> um, I know. When I, when I, am I like moving the thing? Shark Angel, um, the resident scientist. I do work with waterfront education, and I do uh, I do crew tall ships. I'll talk about that a little bit. I, I'm a gunner on the XC and Irving Johnson, which is a lot of fun. I highly recommend it if you like to blow things up. <laughs> like I said, I have a chemistry undergrad degree, so. Um, but my work is on global shark populations. Countershade is my platform, uh, and I have data from everyone from scientists to citizen scientists, sailors scuba divers, et cetera, to forecast global shark populations for shark tourism and for science. Um, <clears throat> so that's moving along really nicely. But everybody always asks me, how can you tell if sharks are in the water? So here's, here's, the, here's how you tell. So you stick your hand in the ocean. <laughs> you take it out. Is it wet? 
<laughs> if it is, there are sharks. There are always sharks in the water. There are sharks out here right now. There are sharks all over the place. So again, I want to ask you guys, what do you think of when you hear sharks? What did you all say? Great white. Of course. Or makos or salmon sharks, because they look almost like great whites. People don't always understand the difference. But people always think of great whites, but there's small sharks, there's big sharks, there's whale sharks, there's sharks that look scary, there's sharks that don't look scary. So basically, they're always there, and that's a good thing. So the facts are that they are dinosaurs. So this is really scary, and I really want to accentuate this, that they have been on this planet for like 400 million years. So they have survived all sorts of natural, natural disasters. And then the scary thing is they might not survive humans. So that's what's really scary. Um, they're kind of like cartilaginous fish. So as you know, that's your ear. That's why we don't have shark skeletons. We only have shark teeth in the fossil record. They have up to 3,000 teeth. These are tiger shark teeth I have in this little picture. There's over 400 known species, so they're not just jaws and great white. I don't understand why people get bit anyway, so if they hear the music. <laughs> <laughs> and this is for my friend Matt, I don't know where he went, but he was saying I should come in with a peg leg for like really good effect. <laughs> and I said, you know, I actually don't have to because I can just let you guys know, you don't have to swim faster than the shark. You just have to swim faster than your buddy. <laughs> So I was a dive instructor's assistant in college, and that was my last line off the back of the boat. And we could tell how daring the group was, because the, the instructor would say, remember, you don't have to swim faster than the shark. And I'd say, you just have to swim faster than the buddy. And I'd hold my mask and fall off. And sometimes I'd be sitting there for 20 minutes before somebody else jumped in. And I'd be, oh, yeah. But here's some more facts. Sharks have great vision. Did you know their night vision is actually better than a cat's or a wolf's? So that thing that they can't really see and they're stupid, not true. Um, their sense of smell is 10,000 times better than a human. They can detect electrical impulses, and, but they're picky eaters, and we'll get to that. And the cool fact, fun fact, a little party favor fact I wanted to tell you guys is how you can tell the difference between a male and a female. So when you see all of the scientists on the Discovery Channel, and, oh my god, look at this male, look at this female, and you're like, how do they know? You can tell the males have claspers, the females don't. Those are claspers on a male. The female doesn't have it. And stingrays the same thing. So if you can see the side or the bottom of a shark, you can tell right away if it's a male or female. So you can impress your friends. Oh, that's a beautiful male. And they're like, how did you know that? So here are some fun shark behaviors. This is Guadalupe Island, Mexico. These are great white sharks that they will pass by here. The, we think they go from the Farallones down to Mexico and back. So Guadalupe Island is a um, sea uh, um, elephant seal rookery, right? So we, are in, we have to be in a cage there because it's really deep water. And if all of us, so say all of us in this room are sea lions or seals, and I'm the person, I have this and that many chance of the shark mistaking me. So that's why you were, you were, you're in the cage when you dive at places like this. So I'll let you see kind of the cool stuff here. Well, this is last November, the first shark Kids love this video because the shark is peeing on me. And I didn't realize he was peeing on me, or she was peeing on me, until I got the video at home and I said, oh, gee, thanks a lot. <laughs> so I've been peeing on him, I've been pooped on by a whale, too. She's 16 feet long and as wide as my forerunner. And so, yes, they do have bait. This, you see the scar on him. He was caught in a rope and divers got him free. Otherwise, he would have died because he was carrying along a lot of stuff. So you can see they do come pretty close to the cage, but they're not trying to eat us in the cage. That video you saw of the shark going into the cage, it was baited incorrectly and they baited it to go right in the cage. Do you can see, they're just like, oh, you guys want a show? Okay, I'll give you a show. That's another big female. The females are bigger than the males, and that's usually your first sign that it's a female if she's much wider. That's 
about a, another, she's only about 14 feet. Only. Yeah. Only. last year because it was um, too rough, so we were just at the surface cage. But that's some great white behavior. As you can see none of us then were trying to actually eat us. So this video is all the pictures. These are a bunch of still pictures of all of them. Mostly Bryn. That's not Bryn, but Bryn is the biggest one you'll see here. There she is. Yeah, she's the one. She's as wide as my forerunner. <laughs> and just gorgeous. Some more facts. So what I was saying earlier, how we always think of great whites, but sharks can be from seven inches to 50 feet long. This is a basking shark in a picture. Not my picture, it's a stock photo. Um, they have really good hearing also. They can hear from really far away. And then short fin makos are said to be the fastest sharks between 20 and 25 miles an hour. We have short fin makos here in our area. You don't see them as much. If you, any of you are fishermen that maybe go farther out, you may see them. I see some nods. So um, sometimes we'll mistake them for great whites as well. We're good so far? Yeah? Okay. Um, so here's the facts. They've only killed about 50 people in the last 100 years. But guess how many? So the time we're together, about an hour, we're going to kill 11,000 sharks. We kill humans close to 100 million sharks every year. Did you know there are 80% fewer great white sharks than when Jaws came out? So the writer, Peter Benchley, and his wife, when they saw that they couldn't unring that bell, spent the rest of their lives as conservationists trying to unring that bell. Because the only, the only few of us who wanted to grow up to be Matt Hooper, the rest of us wanted to grow up to be Quint, right? <laughs> so the point is, an ocean without sharks is much scarier than an ocean with sharks. Did you know the bigger sharks can sequester as much carbon in their bodies as sometimes a big redwood? Really? Uh, Geez, sharks are important for climate change. Imagine that. They also get rid of all the sick animals and the dying animals. So, okay, there's a great thing from, if you guys have heard of the Pew Charitable Trust, yeah. there's a really great, if you get their newsletter, I highly recommend it because they have all these great, you know, studies they do and they put a lot of science behind it. A couple weeks ago, they put one out where they took the sharks out. It was a simulation, simulation they did in Hawaii where they took the sharks out and another species thrived and flourished, and guess what? All of the seaweed, all of the plants were gone in the ocean and the ocean turned black there. And that is what ha that's what will happen without sharks in the water. So, that small chance that maybe, and so I gotta tell you, if somebody should have been bit, they told me in college my last words will be, that shark won't bite me. 
I should have been bit by now. I have been by so many. We're not their food. They like really fatty stuff. And no, it's not if you have a little extra in here. This is still not as dense as a seal or a sea lion. You know, that is what they want. That really, really amazing. So whatever blubber you have is nothing compared to a pinniped. It just isn't. It's not, it just, you're like, well, I've got a big butt. No, it's not the same. Sharks don't want it. And have I ever been attacked? I have, because let me just tell you what an attack is, and I'm gonna demonstrate here on my friend Jim. If I'm a shark and I go like this, bump him, that is characterized as an attack in the global shark attack file, so the numbers are skewed. And do you know why that's characterized as an attack? Because they're feeling to see if they're food with the ampullae of Lorenzini in their nose. There are these gel-filled sacs that they can kind of figure out what you are. So yes, I've been bumped by many sharks. I've been attacked, I don't know how many times, because I've been in water with lots of sharks. They bump me and they go, oh, this skinny thing? No, <laughs> not food. So, never been bitten, thankfully. So, there's that. But they need our protection. So, oh, there's me and Brynn in the cage again. I love her. So, fun fact, do you remember Quint? Black like doll eyes. No, great white sharks have blue eyes. I've seen them myself. They're beautiful. So they don't hunt humans. They don't detect a person bleeding from miles away. So if you come up close to me and see the big scar on my face here, I've got hit by my surfboard fin about 200 yards out. I've also got hit by my fin in my head. Uh, I th never have I been shark bait. So imagine this. Yes, they can detect blood a certain amount of way. But imagine everything bleeding in the water and the cacophony that would be around them and how they... So, if you cut yourself in the water and you're not shark bait, get over yourself. It's not <laughs> happening, okay? It's like, you know, the myth perpetuated. Also, women and girls don't attract sharks. Think about that for a minute, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> if that was true, all of us female shark researchers would have a really easy time. So, killing sharks for their fins is actually killing the oceans. And when uh, the Asian continents, and I've got to tell you, China comes and kills everything. How I know this, I was in Fiji in March, and the boat captains were telling me, hey, out to 200 miles where, where they have the protective zone, they said China comes right up to that and takes everything, coral, everything you don't even eat and they take the sharks to do their fins. When a shark is finned, fun fact, they throw it back in the water. It could take three days for it to die. Is that cool? That sucks. And it's a neurotoxin. So, you know, there's a lot of toxins in the sea. I mean, where I surf in El Porto, there's smokestacks there, so if you turn off the lights, I'd probably glow. But there's neurotoxins, aka mercury and shark fins. They don't even have a good taste. They're hazardous for your health. They put all this other stuff in it, and it's a dumb delicacy that's killing the ocean. So, I'll get off the soapbox and back to fun. Got a smile. <laughs> so, this is a longer video. This is gonna be my friend Eric Martin. He's gonna tell us. Um, Eric Martin's the co-director at the Manhattan Beach Pier Aquarium that I do some work with. And he, his main thing is orcas. He studies some orca pods off the coast. And he's got a story and some pictures for us that I think you'll find interesting. Hi, my name is Eric Martin. I'm the co-director of the Brown House Aquarium here in Manhattan Beach. So, I love, my main two animals that I really love are sharks and also whales. Not just any whales, killer whales. So if you can put those two things together, <laughs> then you have one heck of a trip. And that's exactly what happened in one day in November of 2016, is I got a quick phone call of possible killer whales, I'm using the word possible, off of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. So anyways, uh, so I had uh, Cody Martin, which is my son, jumped on my boat, and I had Lisa Shulman, which she's in charge of the killer whale project, and of course me. So we went down to go try to track them down, we saw finally about, uh, about uh, 45 minutes to an hour being out of the water, we got to see some blows off in the distance, and boom, there were the killer whales. 
it was a group of killer whales that we call the offshore killer whales. They come all the way down from Alaska to spend the winter down here. So here we were, photo identifying all these animals to figure out who's who. And Elisa Shulman said, hey Eric, why don't you put your drone up there because they could be feeding on something because they look like there's some behavior of some kind of food stuff going on. So anyways, I put the drone up and uh, started filming the drone, which is the images that you're probably going to be seeing in this. And uh, didn't know of anything at the time, how cool it was going to be. So anyway, so I got some awesome drone stuff and everything and brought the drone in. And uh, then eventually came home and went on the computer to go see the footage what I got. <laughs> and first thing comes up, see the killer whales moving and doing all this awesome stuff. And then I said to myself, oh my God, the killer whale is dragging a plastic bag on its left pectoral fin. Yes, sorry, I thought it was a plastic bag. So then I stopped it, redid it to go look at it. To my amazement, it was not a plastic bag. It was a blue shark. It actually was carrying a blue shark on its left pectoral fin. We knew these orcas feed on sharks because about a week later, another group of orcas called the offshores were in Monterey, and one happened to grab a treasure shark, and that was put on video. That was filmed from a drone. And then I happened to get this one, which was a blue shark, which was filmed with a drone. So, it was a really incredible encounter. Yes, the shark did die, but it didn't die from humans. It died from natural stuff, such as sharks have to eat, lions have to eat deer, so on down the line with the natural food chain. But it was the coolest thing, and it was the first documented report by film of these orcas feeding not only on sharks, but blue sharks. So, orcas are scary. I want to kayak with them, but marine mammals are scared. So, two of the things people tell me, oh, you surf? Aren't you afraid of sharks? I'm like, no, I'm afraid of the water, big waves, and marine mammals, because seal sea lions and dolphins have messed with me more than any shark ever has. Orcas are super scary. They're super smart. They're big. And I was going to go to South Africa this year, however, Maybe some of you heard about this, and this happened at the Farallon Islands also a few years ago. Orcas precisionly take out the livers of sharks, white sharks. They just take the livers out, leave the carcass. Once a white shark smells its own death, it's gone. Which is why uh, we haven't had as many white sharks in Manhattan Beach as the previous years, because some Nimrod captured one off the pier illegally and killed it. But Sharks will, white sharks will go away from their own death. So orcas kill white sharks, they kill other sharks, they are scary. They're also a top predator. They're just as important as sharks. So if we killed all the orcas, the oceans would also die. But when you think the shark is a top predator, it's not a food chain, it's a food web. It's orcas and big marine mammals and sharks. and So it's all interconnected. But just when you think you're the king of the sea, you're not. <laughs> so. Now, one of the hashtags I like to use is replace fear with fact. So, Shark Week in 2014 made a lot of us scientists really mad. In fact, because of me, there are deleted Twitter accounts from documentarians that claim to make documentaries about megalodons, which if any one of you sit there and say, how do we know megalodons don't exist? I need you to leave now. <laughs> They don't. Get over it. <laughs> Anyways, just kidding. Not really. But, <laughs> so, Discovery Channel got really excited, wanted to make more money, and they did uh, docudramas. You know, like shows we like to watch on TNT and in the movies and things like that. But all these years, we were really excited about actually getting facts from like Nat Geo and Discovery. Nat Geo still does fact for Shelly. Well, except for the mermaid thing. But, <laughs> Yeah, mermaids. Um, so, you know, they got really excited about that, and they said that there was a shark in Canada and a river, and they had some others. Anyways, I personally called out a filmmaker. I can't, oh, it was the Megalodon thing. 
And I, pers I looked up the filmmaker on IMDb, if you know what that is, but it just, you know, it shows every actor and filmmaker. And I saw this filmmaker that made it, and all she had done before that was fiction. And she was making this, and I called her out on Twitter. I said, sweetheart, this is wrong. And she tried to threaten me, all this other stuff. I'm like, threaten me all you want. I will stand here and win every legal battle because you are full of poo-poo right now. <laughs> you are wrong. You know, and so anyways, she ended up deleting all the tweets and all that. But discovered, it wasn't just me. It was everyone. Dr. Sylvia Earle got on it. I mean, everyone got on them. So... They, they got a little bit better. This is a, some of the things from this year. And um, Return of the Great White Serial Killer. <laughs> so I can explain that. All the pictures you see of me in Guadalupe Island is with Jimmy and Ralph, who are the researchers in the boat that are in that. And what that, what that is, is if you're familiar with Surf Beach up near Lompoc, every two years somebody seems to get eaten. Okay. So, it's a seal rookery, and again, let me just explain, if I'm standing here in between all of you, you're all seals, and sea lions, or whatever, I'm the surfer, I have this and this many chance of getting bitten. And unfortunately, once every two years, um, it was either death or really bad, and you know, no waves were... I like to surf, okay? No wave is, you know, if somebody says, oh, somebody gets bit every time they surf, I'll be like, okay, I'm going down the street, you know? It's not worth it. Um, so Return of the Great White Serial Killer is because every two years there seems to be an attack and they got teeth from each of them and they wanted to do the DNA to see if it was the same shark. So, as opposed to explaining like that, Discovery said, oh, we'll call it this. So, all of us shark scientists know they do that to us. I was interviewed in San Diego recently and um, talking about, you know, facts and the reporter did a great job. I said, hey, yeah, you know, make sure you be factual or I'll slam you on social media. Ha <laughs> kidding, not kidding, you know. <laughs> And he did a really good job, but the fact, the fact that they honed in on was when they said, well, what about when you, if you, if you get attached, did you punch him in the nose? I go, no, it's gonna piss him off. I'd go for the gills. And they're like, oh, okay, go for the gills. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I'm glad I armed you with that. But anyway, so they do it to all of us. Unfortunately, we know it's the trade-off where it's like, they have to dress you up a little, like, you know, if I was on, well, you know, if you wanted to present me somewhere, you might make me wear big girl pants and do my hair or something. Like, that's what they do to us, you know? Mm -hmm. So, with that, I want to show you some non-cage diving. Someone got mad at me once this because this video, because I move a little, might make them seasick, but I'm assuming we're all mariners in here. And if not, if it makes you seasick, I'm sorry ahead of time. But, uh, this is, I'm not the best. There, I got it. <laughs> but yeah, that's me and my fins. So, um, I ripped a, an eardrum a couple years ago, so I'm on the mermaid line and not at the bottom, but there's a nice little nurse shark underneath me, and I'm like, woo, there's a nurse shark. But the fun thing about this video is, you know how everybody says, oh, white tips are gnarly and they'll eat you? Well, a white tip goes right by me and it doesn't eat me. <laughs> I'll point it out in a minute. But this is Banga, it's pronounced Banga Lagoon. This is a reef that almost died, <coughs> where they, um, they overfished it. And uh, there was almost nothing on this reef. And then uh, outsiders and other scientists came in and said, hey, you guys need to protect this, etc." So the natives have been trained as scientists and citizen scientists, and they feed the sharks now and make a ton of money off tourism, which many countries do. And they have a sustainable fishery. And they have a happy ecosystem. There's that white tip. Oh no, it's eating me. Nope, it's gone. <laughs> so this is non cave but this nerd, you know, she's like, hey, what's up? Got her little fish around me. I highly, highly recommend if you can ever go to Bangalore Lagoon, do it. Beautiful, beautiful. Not that expensive either. Relatively speaking. But that's one example of shark tourism. So what can you do? What can you do to, re to help sharks? Replace fear with facts. Anytime you hear some dummy say, track sharks, say, no, dummy, they don't. <laughs> I have a video about that. Really simple thing you can, you can do for the entire ocean is don't use straws. When you go out to eat, Say, and you, you know, the server takes your order, say, hi, no straws here. No matter how you recycle them, another, almost 80% of them end up back in the ocean. A lot of us have seen the sea turtle video with it up the nose. 
plastic's very bad for the ocean, so that will help everything. Um, and then use your experience to be ambassador for sharks. How can you do that? There's a few ways. So my friend Nick works down in San Diego, so this video might make you seasick because there's some water moving in it. But <coughs> you can do things like go to SC Expeditions with my friend Nick. He's a shark diver. Hi, Nick. Hey. And, uh, <laughs> he got his start down in uh, down in Guadalupe Island. So you go out about an hour from Mission Beach, and it doesn't cost that much. And we're going to go non-cage diving with blue sharks. And you're with about four or five people, divers, regular people. You don't have to be a scientist. Anybody can go on this. And while you're waiting for the sharks, you get explain, you know, you get all the down, you know, the download about okay, here's what we're gonna do. And there's a lot, so the reason this video is so long to just kind of illustrate to you all that stuff you see on Discovery Channel where it's like nonstop, that can take like months to film. I can't tell you how much video I have of nothing just to bring you what I've shown you today. That is the life of a marine researcher. You're on a boat all day like this. <laughs> waiting. And then you're waiting again. And, you're wait and then you're throwing some chum out. And we're throwing oil out. So the bottle we have is a bottle of oil, not blood. And then we're throwing the drone out. And we're trying it. So this is the short version of how much time we spend on the water. Waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. So, when your kids and grandkids want to be marine scientists, tell them, yes, it's the most awesome job ever, but you have to be very patient because this is what happens. Oh, no, I think we see a shark. Here's this beautiful blue shark. She's coming into the frame now. There she is. She's about five feet long, about 200 pounds. And she'll come by and you can see why she's called a blue shark. And you see that beautiful blue at the top. Oh, is that food? No, it's a blue. <laughs> so, from the time we got on the boat till now, it's four hours, just FYI. Oh my What's the orange thing then? It's just a buoy. Pardon? The orange thing is just a buoy. Thank you. All that stuff you see, that's the chum slick. So we're going to get on the water on the other side of the chum slick. Because sharks do come up from below, and you don't want to be mistaken for something. So you stay out of the chum slick, and that's what all that debris is, you see. So she sees the chum slick, and she's like, hmm, is this orange thing food? So it's just kind of there to attract her. It's a different color. The contrast is what catches their eye. Hi, that's me. I have no idea why I didn't cut this shorter, but here you go. <clears throat> this is another hour later. And we have these little sticks in our hands just to, because what you do is if they come a little too close, you just kind of push them away. And they do that in Fiji too. And anywhere where they have shark diving, they just kind of if the shark comes in too like this, like <laughs> so Jim would have a stick and it pushed me back a little bit. So she's going to come up to me in a moment. She's gonna come in from this over this side. Yes, the GoPro's on my wrist, as you can tell. Nick in front of me. So any, anybody can do that. So you can use those kind of experiences. To, we had a high school teacher and two professional photographers with us in that trip. And so my friend Ralph and Jimmy, the guys, these are the guys that did Great White Shark Serial Killer, whatever. And there's another expedition that I'll be there if you're super, if you're interested in it, you want to come, you don't actually have to be certified to dive. You can come with us, come ask me about it later. That's fine. Um, if that's not your thing, you can always come out to 
if you really, if you think I'm awesome and want to follow me around, you can always, <laughs> you can always, I'll be a, a gunner on the XC Johnson um, for the Data Point Tall Ships Festival for the small gun and for the six pound cannon as well. I'm firing this thing at other ships, which is always fun. It's a blank, but there are, you know, projectiles, so. Um, but that is my presentation, and to that, I'm gonna open it up to questions from you. Why is the opening on the shark cage as large as it is? <laughs> That's a really good question. So the opening is about this big. It looks bigger underwater. Remember that. Everything looks bigger underwater. So it's about like that. Uh, so you can see, because if you've got too much, you can't film and get out and touch and do things. All right, this guy back here had a question for you guys, but I'll come back. In the wild, what is the lifespan of a great white? Because I read this week that uh, <coughs> SeaWorld had euthanized a 41-year-old great white. So are uh, SeaWorld good for the great white or are they villains? So that's two questions. So how long, do, how long do great white sharks live in the wild? We know they can live up to about 75 years. Um, the biggest one on record that we've seen is Deep Blue, if you saw that video, is bigger than Bryn, that one I showed you, about by another five feet. Hope to see her this year. SeaWorld's villains or not, I can get on my soapbox about that, or I can ask a, let somebody else ask a question, but I'm not a fan of SeaWorld. Okay. There was a question over here. Can sharks see color? Yes, sharks can see contrast and stuff, and it depends on the type of shark. They're, they're not colorblind, they can tell the difference in colors, but they don't have an eye like ours, and out of the water they don't see like us at all, they have to be underwater. So depending on the type of shark, they have different types of lenses. Lenses. <laughs> Are sharks always hungry or do they get full? Oh, <laughs> oh that's a good question. Are sharks always hungry? So I'm always hungry. Um, but they do get full. Shark, great whites can actually go quite some time without eating. Um, so they do get full. They're not always hungry. There's so many questions. Why are there so many great whites in Ventura lately? So that's a really good question. Why are there so many great whites in Ventura? Why do you so many have to ask that? Okay. So <clears throat> there are. This year it's been awesome because, as I remember when I told you white sharks don't like the smell of their own death and they go away? So the last time we saw this many sharks was in 2013, and then all of a sudden all the yahoos were out there at the piers trying to catch great whites and catch sharks and blah, blah, blah. And so they'd catch them and then they would die, and they're the young of the years that they would catch. White sharks are four to five feet when they're born. They're babies. You're catching an infant, and you're killing it because when they catch it, bring it up on the pier and they're all you know, a lot of times they're not going to live, so they go away. So the temperatures have been a little warmer, and the food has been moving, so they've been coming up here. I know you guys had some breaching up here recently, which is super cool. We had, they're not happy about it. Um, but they're following the food, and it's good to see more white sharks, because that means it's a healthy ocean. And you have a... If you see one, if you actually see a white shark, please go buy a lottery ticket. It's a very good sign. <laughs> you want to follow up? Well, I was just curious. I know they're breaching in the harbor, but there's one that's at Solomar, and it's only one, and he just goes up and down. They do that when they find it. So it's probably a juvenile, and it's probably lots of stingrays there, and it's eating them. So we had that in Long... They, they were, it was probably one of the ones in Long Beach back in May, where there's... Um, uh, I forget the name of the beach in Long Beach, but we could go there any day of the week and see five or six of them. We could go walk out into the water next to them and like look at them. They'd be like, oh, dude, sorry, let me get out of your way. And you do not have... So they're not bullies also, remember. So we're between four and six feet. They like to go th for things bigger. Baby sharks like to eat stingrays and smaller sharks. So that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for you. So it's okay. Be happy you see them. 
Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> this guy back here. Yeah, so two questions. Um, first, the occasional uh, bite into a, a surfboard or a kayak. What are they doing in that regard? And is it just tasting to see if they like it? And then second, when I was a kid, there were a lot of blue sharks around in the, San, you know, in the, in the islands. And I used to be on a deckhand as a boat. Uh, crew member, and uh, what are the what are the what, what are they fishing the blue sharks for? So we're not fishing blue sharks; we're looking for them. Is the, is the answer there? But I'll get back to that. So the blue sharks were more abundant around here, but now you find them on the continental shelf, like where we saw that one. It took us hours to get her up, and we were on the shelf where it goes down a few thousand feet, and so that's how we brought her up. But they were in closer before because there was more food for them, and so their food is has moved out, or they have figured out that, mm, I don't want to be around here, we keep getting caught. So that is why you don't see them as much in, yeah, because I don't see them inland at all, ever. I mean, I never, you don't see makos inland. You only see baby whites, leopards, swells, and horn sharks in. And usually it's leopards and stuff. And then kayakers and surfers and stuff. So the woman who was bit in San Onofre earlier this year only had one bite to it, and it was a 12-foot shark. So that's like about a teenage, well, no, it's like a 10-foot. It's like a teenager. So it was a devastating bite. So it took one, and, and that fatty thing I told you about before, it spit her out like, oh, not my food. Unfortunately, it's a very devastating bite. And I've seen myself when they accidentally bite stuff like seagulls and things. They're like, because like I said, they're picky eaters. And they're like, oh, no. And they spit it out. But unfortunately, they just do a lot of damage. So they get attracted by a number of things, you know. Maybe they're very hungry. Like, maybe they weren't full. Um, maybe it's been a while since they've eaten. Maybe you did something. Maybe you're in a, you know. If you see a lot of seals and sea lions around, and if they're jumping out of the water, freaking out, get out. <laughs> Go, like, more obey, especially. Yes. People have been bitten there before. I went out surfing there once many years ago, saw a bunch of seals jumping up out of the water, super scared. I was like, hmm, that's my cue. <laughs> you know. Do they regularly return to the place where they were born? That's such a good question, and we don't know, and that's part of the research. Um, we like to think that, because that happens in sea turtles, you know, they've had that research. So that's why they're tagged, and um, like Dr. Chris Lowe in Long Beach does tagging of, of juveniles, um, but then the tags come off, and he doesn't do DNA studies, so we can't correlate that later. So the answer is maybe. <laughs> The Channel Islands in August, their breeding time for great whites? So, not sure, but baby shark birthing season is spring, early summer in the Santa Monica Bay. So, we see a lot of baby young of the year, four to five footers. We don't exactly know where they breed. If we could get them breeding, like we don't have video of great white sharks doing it or giving birth. And if we could get either of those, any of our careers would be made. In fact, I'm talking to some Princeton robotics people now trying to think about getting some stuff underwater next year for baby shark season because we can, if we can actually get a great white birth, like we know they're born somewhere around there, we don't know where they actually come out and then we don't know where they actually really breed. So I'm going to go to the back now. Let's see. How are sharks? Oh yeah, that's a really good question. Ocean acidification affects everything, and if they're, they're, they can tolerate within a certain amount, you know, some sharks can tolerate higher or lower pH, and then, so they go into different brackish or different types of water. They tolerate it as best they can, and unfortunately it's not good. So if the, if the ocean gets more acidic, there comes to a point where they're just not going to tolerate it, just like everything else, because their food will die first before they do and then we'll start. How do sharks take care of their young? They don't. They're bored. <laughs> ah, she won the bet! <laughs> yeah, sister. <laughs> yeah, uh, mama shark gives birth to baby shark, or so there's 
A few different ways sharks give birth. They either lay an egg, or they have the eggs inside that hatch and it looks like they give live birth. There's a few, there's viviparous, oviviparous, oviparous. They, once the baby's gone, it's on its own. So there's no like, like, like some of the Jaws movies where like, oh, mama shark came back. No, dummy, it did not come back. Mama shark is like, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there are people that say the pilots, the remoras, and um, but I don't know enough about them because I don't study the pilots or the remoras. I do notice remoras, you know, with the little flat heads that come on the sharks. And some of the places where the sharks are really fell, really well fed are some of the biggest, fattest, most independent remoras I've ever seen. So I have determined they are opportunistic and don't need the shark all the time. Little buggers. <laughs> One more. What can you tell us about bull sharks? So bull sharks in Fiji don't want to eat you, but apparently they do in Florida. <laughs> and in Florida, they're really good at going up into the estuary, into brackish water. Um, so that tells me the food source is a lot different, and they need to get in there and try to get like the manatees and things like that that go up and they hide there. But when they're well fed in other places like Fiji, they like they I didn't I don't had the video up where there's a bull shark next to my friends and like bigger than I, as much as like all of us here in this front row just swims right by me like, what's up? So, depends on the area they're in. But bull sharks and tiger sharks are known to be nastier than other sharks, but it's a locational thing because there's tigers in Fiji too that are like, they just don't care. I think that's all the time I have. So if anybody else has any other questions, you can come up and see me or come get one of my cards. But I just want to thank you guys. You've been wonderful. Thank <laughs> you.